Hey, Peter, thanks for having me on. Um, so are we all ready to jump right into the presentation here? Sure. We are. Good to go. Good to go. Okay, Suma Silver. So this is a company that was founded about two and a half years ago in March of 2020 with a focus in going into these old, famous, historic mining jurisdictions and applying to modern focuses. And quickly, quickly, we realized that there is plenty of juice left to squeeze and you know, lots and lots of potential. So two high-grade silver projects, <clears throat> one in Nevada and one in New Mexico. Talking about the team here, Galen McNamara, he's their CEO, geologist by trade for over 15 years. And he is a senior project, was a senior project manager at Next Gen Energy. So that was where a lot of his exploration success came. Uh, they founded the, I think it was called the Aero Discovery for Next Gen. That was up in the northern Athabasca region. And we all know that stock, you know, really was one of a one of the big Canadian success stories. Uh, Chris Leslie, another geologist with over 15 years experience in the industry. Uh, he co-discovered the Blackwater Gold Deposit in BC. That was about 8.2 million ounces in the proven and probable category. Uh, Michael Connert here, he's the founder and CEO of Vizla Silver. So they're taking a very similar approach to us, but down in Mexico and having quite a bit of success. It was great to have his, uh, his sort of experience and his expertise leading our charge as well. Last person here I'll note is uh, Chris York. He's our VP of exploration. He's got 12 years experience running. Uh, and he ran a lot of the exploration for some of the majors like Hecla and Barrick back in the day. So having, you know, Someone like that with boots on the ground experience leading our charge is uh, very critical. Cap structure here. So these are all Canadian figures. I'll just note right off the bat. Recent share price were about 66, 67 cents. Market cap just north of about 50 million. Uh, common shares out just north of 78 million. Uh, fully diluted a little bit over 100 million as well. Working capital, we have, uh, it says 7 million, but it's more closer to about six, six and a half in that neighborhood right now, uh, no debt. So I will mention our last financing was done at the end of last January, where we raised about $11.5 million. On that, we had lead orders from Eric Sprott and First Majestic, who both went in for $2 million each. Uh, Eric Sprott, he's been with us since our very, very beginning. Uh, he's put in, you know, checks at 25 cents in the last couple of rounds as well. So since our inception, we've raised 35 million. He's put in 10 personally himself, and that's where he makes up 15% of our share structure there. So management insiders, they own about 30%, institutional high net worth, 25 there, retail, 27. So, you know, we're very tightly held, which I know a lot of people like to see. And then with that said, we still trade around, you know, 100,000 shares a day. So perfect balance there, which is really healthy. Okay, projects here. Let's get into the first one here. This is the Mogollon project in Southwest New Mexico. So this was actually the largest historic silver producer in New Mexico, where at least, you know, 16 and a half million ounces of silver and 340,000 ounces of gold were produced at, you know, some insane grades, almost 800 grams per ton silver equivalent. And just to, so you guys know, when I say silver equivalent, that's just silver gold. We're not including copper, link, Z, any weird stuff like that, just silver gold. So that was all produced between the 1880s and 1942. And the only reason it shut down at that point was because that's when the World War II Wartime Act came in and all silver production had to be ceased. So from there, it remained pretty much inactive between about 1942 and the late 70s, early 80s. At that point, a famous geologist by the name of John Livermore came in, and he was famous for, you know, those early Carlin style deposits up in Nevada with Newmont. So he came in here and he actually drilled this project out of his own pocket in the 70s and 80s, and he came up with some very, very interesting results. So these, most of his stuff kind of was between like, you know, say eight or nine meters of true thickness across 400 to 450 grams per ton silver equivalent. So those holes, we can most likely use those in our resource estimate. Um, but nonetheless, it gives us, you know, a perfect roadmap of where to come in here and start drilling high grade holes right away. So here, you know, we like to, you know, say these weird cliches like under the radar, unfinished business, multiple targets. Well, you know, what does that really mean? Well, the first program we're doing is only testing 1% of respective strike length of veins on this project. That just gives you a little bit of flavor on, you know, what's the huge potential here. Okay, consolidated extension drilling. So this is the first target area. We've drilled and returned six holes, all of which have hit, you know, very high grade silver gold mineralization. Um, right now we have three holes currently pending in the lab as we're drilling there now. And then let's say, you know, we are able to use those eight or nine holes by John in our resource estimate. 
then that's going to leave us with probably another 10 or 15 that we still need to drill, let's say. And at that point, we'll be able to assess the potential for a maiden resource estimate. And just to let you guys know as well, so we are planning on drilling right now um, until the end of February. And with our current cash, cash position, we are well financed enough to get through that and probably still have, you know, two, three million left over at the end point there. Okay, so this is just a quick map here of where we're drilling currently at the consolidated target. This white stuff here outlines all the way down here. This is the old soaps and where the actual historic mining took place. And, you know, both one, two, three, four, four and six, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're continuing downtrend, systematically building ounces via high grade holes. And we've successfully done that. I do want to mention here, however, hole five, this is a 270 meter step out from the trend, at which point we drilled 448 grams per ton over 31 meters. So that's a world-class hole. When we're hitting stuff like, you know, that number there, I mean, even hole four here, 11.6 meters of 430, I mean, these holes build ounces incredibly fast. I mean, that's why we're drilling here now and why we're you know, talking about it first here in our slide, this project. I mean, it's incredible how fast you can build ounces in this. First resource estimate, it's going to be in this 500 by 350 meter area at an inferred spacing at which we think will be about 75 meters by 75 meters. Okay, just stepping out a little bit here. So a kilometer and a half to the south is probably are going to be our next target called the Everly Mine. Um, we don't have as much historical data on it. Um, and also it wasn't included in the original land package. We actually went out and picked this up um, off another lady who owned it. Uh, we optioned it off her for about 600,000 US, and we currently have it now. Um, like I said, we don't have quite as much data. We do know that there is high grade mineralization. We actually do have some old core as well. Um, so, yeah, this is something that we're going to follow up with next year, and it does need to be drilled based off you know, some of the stuff that we do have. These are just some more targets here that all kind of have similar flavor. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, this slide here kind of ties it all together. So the blue lines, or sorry, the total blue area, this is a total map of our project here and our entire land package. The red lines, that's all the perspective strike, uh, strike, <clears throat> sorry, vein structure that we have at surface. So, I mean, cumulatively, there's about 50 kilometers of strike on this project. And this current drilling area that we're in, just this little green box here, that's just 1% of the total vein strike that is being drilled at this project right now. I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of kind of idea on how much potential is here. Okay, Mogollon project option term. So we're optioning this off another Canadian junior company called Allegiant Gold. And sort of their focus right now is some lower grade open pit gold stuff up in Nevada. So for them, a high grade, you know, underground silver project in New Mexico, it doesn't really fit their focus, but for us, it was perfect. So the terms on this, uh, three year option to own 75%. So it's 3 million US, mostly in stock for that first 75%. And attached to that is a $3 million work commitment as well, which we're almost through. And then at our election, we can top that 75% up to 100% for another 3 million mostly in stock. Okay, the Hughes project. So this is our project in Nevada. It's the one we're probably a little bit more well known for at this point, just because we've drilled 58 holes there since our inception. But to give you a quick little bit of a you know, history lesson on this. So the you know so yeah we have the eastern half of the Tonopah district here but the Tonopah district you know back in its heyday it produced something like 175 million ounces of silver a couple million ounces of gold at grades you know north of 1200 grams silver equivalent um and, you know this is you know outside of the Comstock this is the biggest silver production area in in Nevada and this is one of the big reasons that you know when you drive into Nevada you still see welcome to the silver state so I just kind of shows you you know that's what, you know, was there, you know, once many years ago. And, you know, the best place to find a new mine is right next to the old one. It's kind of the old. Okay, but that's great. And all, but, you know, what have we done since we've been here over the last couple of years? Like I said, 58 holes we've drilled. Some of the highlights here, 3,971 grams per ton over 2.8 meters, 536 over 18.1, 1529 over 14, over 4.3 meters. I mean, those are great holes and everything, but what does that really mean? Well, over a three and a half kilometer trend that we have, we have four target areas and we've hit on all four. Of those four target areas, two of them are in the um, past producing area of the district and the other two are completely exploration flavored, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Okay, this is just a quick overview of the project map. 
5,500 acres, very large land package. Uh, the Belmont mine, so this is actually right here. You can kind of take a look and see this is where most of the historic production took place. Tonopah, this is the actual town of Tonopah. So, I mean, the infrastructure here is just phenomenal. You drive in right off the highway and you can go, you know, right onto the project. Pretty perfect. Okay. So here on the left, we have some of our drill results that we've done, but I want to focus more so on the right here because this is as these sorry, are the four target areas that we have. Murray and the Belmont, these are obviously the areas that were drilled and mined historically. And Mizpah and Ruby, these are more of the exploration flavor that have never been drilled and never been mined. So, you know, Belmont in here, as you can see, this is where the bulk of our drillings happened. And, you know, I'm not going to drown you guys in numbers. You can see we've had some very high grade numbers. But what I want to talk about here is the Ruby discovery. Ruby discovery, we've drilled three holes there. Um, the best, you know, probably being only about two meters of 469 grams per ton. So nothing that shoots the lights out, but enough for us to pique our interest. And, you know, long story short here, this is, you know, an extension of the vein that we think the old timers missed due to a fault that was right here. So it's never been drilled, never been mined. And, you know, it's a couple kilometers away on strike, one of the best American mining jurisdictions there is. So let's go down here. And kind of this is a 3D underground um, sort of model that we've put together. So originally we drilled these three holes right here. And as you can see, I mean, they look pretty close together, but they're actually about 100 meters apart. And all these little blue dots here, these are where it exceeded a thousand, or sorry, 100 grams per ton, so equivalent. And then, you know, we said, okay, this is pretty interesting. Why don't we model this all out? And so this green blob here, this is the geophysical anomaly that's never been drilled, never been mined. And this is definitely the area that we want to be following up at, at some point next year. And, you know, I mean, this is great and all, but what does this really mean? I mean, two kilometers, a long trend on one of the most historic mining districts in all of, you know, the U.S. Never been touched. This needs to be followed up on. And we think that, you know, this is the area where we want to find that next 100 million ounce deposit. Okay, district comparison. So how does Nevada, or Tonopah in particular, how does that, you know, stack up against some of these, you know, famous Mexican jurisdictions? So, you know, much more length and strike. Well, obviously they're gonna have many more million ounces of silver produced and gold. As we see here, this is the four kilometers of strike. Okay, well let's, you know, tack on a kilometer and a half where that ruby is and even let it run as it's all open there to the east. Okay, well now we're starting to see that we stack very, very favorably with some of these world-class Mexican mining jurisdictions. Footprint comparisons, okay, so you know, these are all ones that happened down in Mexico. So like the Las Chipas, Sandy Mass, Pinuco, these are all down in Mexico, but they all followed a very similar path that we did in going into these old, you know, historic mining jurisdictions and applying a new modern focus. Silvercrest, I mean, we all know they went from a 20 mil cap to, you know, well north of a billion, billion and a half. Uh, Sandy Mass, I mean, that's been incredibly profitable for Fertz Majestic down in Mexico. And more recently is a Vizla Silver, who, you know, they, their, their resource came out north of 100 million ounces probably six, eight months ago. And, uh, you know, just doing some great stuff down there. So, you know, these are companies that we want to follow in the footsteps of. And, you know, they're naturally, they kind of a good sort of, you know, future comp for us is, you know, they've done, you know, similar stuff in similar jurisdictions per se. And, you know, we have Mogion and Hughes here. And, you know, we got two shots to make this work and we really are excited about both of them. Okay, work program going forward. Um, like I said, until the end of February, we're just drilling in New Mexico. I mean, when we're building ounces that fast, it, you know, it warrants us to want to come back there and follow up with what we have. And at that point, we'll probably assess the potential for a resource estimate. And then after that, I think we're going to come back to uh, Tonopah and take a look at those exploration shots over at Ruby. So that's kind of the opportunity to quickly in you know, 15 minutes for Suma Silver. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll kind of, you know, just touch on is, you know, good high-grade silver projects are hard to find, and good high-grade ones that are in the United States are even harder to find, and we're lucky to have two of them. So that's, you know, the opportunity that we present here. So thanks, guys, for all listening, and I guess I'll open up for some Q&A now. Thanks for that, Jordy. That was a, a really great overview. I uh, I enjoyed following that, although I myself follow the company already very closely. Uh, yeah. It's always nice to it's always nice to get um, you know the refresher. 
So, um, Jordi, can you tell us a little bit about um, the potential needs for infrastructure? I know you did touch on that a little bit, but um, in particular at uh, Tonopah East, how do things look? Because obviously development was on the sort of western side of things. How does it look uh, in the east? It's all all the same. What they have out to the east is something that we can you know totally mirror. Um, I don't know, Peter, have you been to, to the Tonopah district before? I have not, not okay. yet. Well, you can drive through it. I mean, there's a Burger King there. There's a couple hotels, a gas station, and you can just literally peel off the highway on your truck and drive for, you know, five, 10 minutes. And you'll be at one of our drill, drill rigs turning. So it's all right there. It's all ready to go. Fantastic. Um, what about, uh, can you do a little comparison, I guess, of the properties yeah. in terms of size, potential, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, they're both, know kind of similar size i guess uh both hughes and mogion in terms of you know acres they're both kind of around 5500 acres somewhere in there um tonopot i i would say it's there's probably less likely at this point that we'll sort of expand expand sorry on our project in terms of size i mean I don't, a lot of people are obviously familiar with black rock silver they literally have the project that you know touches in this certain parts of the uh, district in here i mean a project kind of goes like that Legion gold is up here. Uh, West fault gold is down here. So it's, you know, it's very already populated there. Um, New Mexico, I'd say there's some parts. Uh, if we go up to the map, I can kind of show you um, in here. We're definitely, you know, interested in maybe picking up some of the parts here that are missing. So definitely open to some expansion there, I'd say. Okay. Um, how about a relationship with the local communities in, in both of these, uh, these areas? For sure. Well, I'll touch on Nevada first, I guess. Um, I, I don't know you, how familiar you guys are with sort of the permitting process, but we're, we're drilling in Nevada. That's on private land right now. And you don't even need a permit there. So you just go right up. And I mean, obviously everybody in Nevada is very familiar with, you know, the mining sector and, you know, it's, it's kind of really ingrained in their community. Like I said, you drive into Nevada, it says, welcome to the silver state, right? So mining is a, you know, a huge part of what they do there. Uh, New Mexico, it's a little bit different, um, you know, it, it's not that people are, are not for mining there, it's just that there hasn't been a ton of mining that's happened there, right? So it takes a lot more, a longer approach of, you know, just educating people on it and, you know, talking, engaging with the community, the First Nations and all that. And, you know, they, we've been doing this, you know, ever since we first got here and we've actually gotten some great feedback from the people down there. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a different process, right? I mean, Nevada, mining's ingrained in what they do. It's like their number one thing. New Mexico, not so much, but it just, you know, it takes an extra level of commitment in speaking with the community there. Makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Jesse and I talked a little bit uh, at the outset uh, of the um, of the conference about silver and its uh, and its role in a green transition. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit in terms of how- Yeah, I'm actually how... happy you, 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 we brought that one up. So you know, people, when you just say silver, they think, okay, silver is just a precious metal, right? But the truth is, I mean, you did a great job of this in your book, by the way. I mean, Thank I think you. it's, you know, 35, 40% is silver as a store of value. And we see already just there alone, based on, you know, macroeconomic conditions, we should see some growth there. And then we see, you know, the 60, 65% that's industrial use. We're talking things like solar, you know, EV, they all take a little bit of silver because it's, you know, is the best. Um, remind me if I'm saying this right, the conductivity, right? That's the best metal for that. And so, you know, you have these two parts, but then you also have this new emerging green metal with silver, right? So it's, exactly. it's becoming this great hybrid metal of it being industrial, you know, you know, a precious metal, and also this hybrid metal that's, you know, or sorry, a green metal of, you know, we need it in solar, we need it in EVs, we need it in all these different things. So I think, you know, solar alone, the demand from that, like you mentioned, I think even in your book and some of your interviews, it, that's going to cause demand to go up a few fold over the next 10 years, that alone, right? So, you know, we could see a perfect storm here between inflation, industrial demands, green uses, all coming together at the perfect time. Exactly. Now, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, on the one hand, some people will say, okay, so if it's uh, has, has so much of an industrial uh, application, what if there's a slowdown? Uh, there, what if there's concerns about recession? What if there's an actual recession? How do you, how do you see that potentially playing out? What, my, how could that affect demand for silver overall? 
if we just enter a straight up recession, how is that going to affect silver? Exactly. Well, you know, obviously we don't want that to get to that point, but silver and gold, they've been around for thousands and thousands of years, right? I mean, we've seen, you know, certain other things that have collapsed recently because, you know, obviously markets, you know, we've raised rates and certain things haven't done well, right? Um, but gold and silver, it's, it's been around forever. Is it going to be around forever, right? And I, I, I don't see a world that we enter where, you know, it, it becomes unfeasible to even mine at this point, right? I mean, silver in particular, like we need this metal just for daily uses, let alone, you know, the fact that it's been a currency for 3,000 years. Exactly. And, and there's also the side that if uh, if there's a slowdown, uh, that could actually affect the production of a lot of the base metals and silver depends so much. About 70% of silver's production comes from uh, producing other metals. So it's not uh, a primary uh, metal in many cases. Your projects are, are exceptional in that, in that sense, um, where so much of the content is silver. But most yeah. silver actually comes from mining other metals. And if there is a slowdown and people have concerns about recession and ongoing concerns, about inflation, um, they might turn to silver as as a hedge, as as you mentioned before, as as, as, as it has been for thousands of years. Um, what kinds of uh, catalysts do you see? Uh, upcoming catalysts that investors could look forward to? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for us, we we're going to have you know two rigs here turning pretty quickly over the next you know three and a half months. You can expect drill results. That's going to be the number one driving catalyst that we have. The last hole that we released from Mogollon in New Mexico. I mean, that was 31 meters of 448 grams per ton silver equivalent. We're, we're following up on those holes. So that's going to be the number one driver of, you know, catalyst over the next three and a half months. Okay. Um, and I think you mentioned this, but uh, how how is funding, I guess, for... Yes. Um, okay. For... So right now we have, say, about six and a half million in cash right now. Now, um, by, by the end of this drill program, We'll, by the end of February, we'll still have about two or three million left over. So not enough where we're going to go jump right into another, um, you know, exploration in, in in Nevada. But it's enough for us to keep going for a little while longer if needed. Um, so yeah, we're we're very well financed. You know, that, the very least get through our program in New Mexico. That's actually uh, from from what I've seen, uh, quite a favorable position to be in. A lot of juniors don't have that uh, luxury right now, and uh, and uh, it's a challenging environment. But uh, you're certainly um, a step ahead in that sense. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, why the company chose to focus on what we call uh, past producing or or brownfields districts versus greenfield. For sure, for sure. Um, well, you know it's. It, when you look at it, I, I know I'll, I'll go back down to the slide that we have down here. Um, you know, when we first started the company, or when Galen did, I should say, I mean, he he kind of modeled a lot of things after, you know, Silvercrest. When he started this company, he wanted to take a big enough swing where, you know, it had that potential to go billion market cap plus, right? So when you look at a Silvercrest, that was in a jurisdiction that was formerly past producing, you know, it was down in Mexico, so a little bit different. Um, even, you know, Sandy Mass for First Majestic, very similar. And now we're, you know, we're seeing with Vizla, right? It's, it's this very similar approach. And, um, you know, the kind of there's an old geo, geo saying that's, you know, the best place to find the new mine is right next to the old head frame, right? And that's an approach that we're taking now. And I mean, I think that, you know, well, you know, when you look at these jurisdictions that produce 175 million ounces of silver, Back in the early 1900s, it's, they do not have the you know the technology that we do today. They're not able to you know do a 3D model like we did at the Ruby Discovery, right? So, I mean, with all those things put together, I mean, you know, we're going to find plenty of new stuff. Agreed. I mean, uh, that's a great point. The fact that uh, technology is has advanced so much, uh, yeah. it makes so many of these past producing. Yeah. Like I'll I'll just kind of build off that quickly at this Ruby Discovery slide. I mean, they, so the old timers, when they were focused on, you know, just in the Belmont area, in that one part of the, the district, and they produce all those million ounces of silver, they totally lost the extension of that vein, right? There was a fault that caused them to totally lose it. And now we think that there's an excellent chance that we might've found that. So that kind of just goes to show you based off just the 3D modeling that we made here, right? I, I think that's a prime example of why we chose to go into some of these jurisdictions. 
That makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's for sure that uh, so many of these technologies are going to start to open up a lot of districts and um, and, and make, uh, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're so short in so many of these metals in yeah. the green transition and uh, technology is going to, in that sense, obviously, is going to probably be, um, a, you know, one of the big drivers to help uh, meet yeah. those needs. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, these two districts. Um, I mean, these two jurisdictions, Nevada and uh, New Mexico, in terms of why uh, why these uh, districts were chosen by uh, by SUMA in terms of where to operate and where to look, where to search for uh, for metal. For sure. So, I mean, if you look at uh, you know where we are right now in the world, I mean, back how many years ago was it when globalization was blowing up and everyone, you know, wanted to do business with all these different countries. But now I think we're going back to, you know, a little bit of nationalization where, you know, we're seeing that iron curtain again, like we, we saw way many years ago, where people need to start focusing on domestic production, right? We want to have these projects right here in our backyards in Canada or the United States in our case, right? I think that there's going to be a serious premium that's put on American assets or, or even Canadian for that matter. Right. I mean, we're seeing some of the majors like look at first Majestic Silver. I mean, they've, you know, divested some of their Mexican assets. and They picked up the Jared Canyon one. Right. We're seeing the majors do it. And, you know, we're seeing and that's you know, why we're taking this focus right now in these American jurisdictions. It's safe. They're de-risked. And, you know, they provide plenty of upside for us to take advantage of. Makes sense. I mean, as you say, um, there's the, the uh, we're, we're going to a globalization in, in reverse. And, uh, and if we're going to make this move to green transition, we really want to have a reliable, more local source of a lot of these, uh, these critical metals. Yeah. Um, Jordy, can you just sort of wrap up for us in a minute or two? Yeah, for sure. I just want to say thanks, guys, to everyone that hopped on to join the call. Also, you know, Thank you to Peter. I mean, it's great to have you on. I know I'm a huge supporter of your book and everyone that should take a take a read at his book. It's it's awesome. And uh, also everyone at Ken as well for putting this on. You guys do a great job and just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And, you know, just, you know, uh, follow our story as we progress over the next, you know, year, year and a half. I think it's definitely exciting times. We're well funded to get through this next drill program. We're going to be communicating with the market, everything that we do. And we're excited to be doing that because, you know, we think we have some very exciting projects here. So just stay tuned in what we're doing. And, uh, you know, we look forward to sharing with you what we discover.